Thanks, Donna. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. My name is Nella Young and I am a Senior Program Director on our National Initiatives Team at Enterprise. And our goal today is to introduce our Collaborative Action Grants and hear some examples and stories from past grantees. We'll also have time for questions at the end. <clears throat> So to start off, I want to let you know who else is joining us on the call today. Um, I'm on the left and uh, my colleague Frederick Sindel is to the right. Uh, he is a program associate with Enterprise and he's also a primary contact for those of you in particular interested in applying to this grant program. He'll be doing a lot of the communication with applicants and grantees, so I want you to see his friendly face and know he's one of um, the helpful people on the team. And also in the middle of this slide is Emily Rausch Elliott. She is the founder of Delta Design Build Workshop in Greenwood, Mississippi. And Emily was one of our first collaborative action grantees and um, back in 2013. And she's going to moderate a discussion with three of our 2016 collaborative action grantees so that we can get to learn a little bit more about what people did specifically in their communities. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly just introduce the panelists, the um, 2016 grantees, and then you'll get to hear from them in their own voices later during the call. So we're really pleased to have with us today Andrea Atkinson from Boston, Panat Zanaman from New Iberia, Louisiana, and Matthew Slats from Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, their stories are great, and I hope that you stick with us and I get to hear some of the um, examples of the collaborative actions that they did during last year. So just quickly to um, review our agenda, I'm going to start us off with a little um, overview of the history and the grant program, and then we'll dig into some more discussion and Q&A together. So uh, Enterprise's Collaborative Action Grants provide organizations with $5,000 to build community agency engage local voices, and connect to long-term community goals. I hope by their name that collaborative actions are self-explanatory. These are projects that include community collaboration at their core. They're often small scale, but they plant a seed of possibility or cultivate some possibility that has already been seeded in the community. Because they're small grants, we've actually really seen that they provide an interesting dose of incentive to move an idea into reality, but at the same time, they allow for a sense of experimentation and even imperfection. They can be permanent or temporary. They can be tangible or intangible, and um, they may include creative placemaking activities like mapping, art installations, community events, um, some things you never would have thought of, uh, some examples which our uh, colleagues on the panel will share with us today. <clears throat> They're typically small scale and low cost and short in duration, but, but they almost always fit into a larger community effort or address a broader community need. And they're in their nature as a small grant, they can also often fill a gap that there might not otherwise really be time or money to invest in, but still makes a difference. So a little bit about how they came to be. Um, there's, this, there's a little story behind this that Emily was a part of. So back in 2013, we piloted this idea of collaborative actions with our Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellows. <clears throat> so these are um, emerging architectural designers who work for three years as a full-time employee of a community development nonprofit. And if that sounds interesting to you or you know someone who'd be interested in that program, um, the applications for fellows are open now, and if you'd be interested in hosting a fellow one day, that application opens um, early 2018 for the next round. So the Rose Fellows partnered with the Fetzer Institute to investigate how design could be a force 
for love, forgiveness, and compassion in the world. And that's not usually how we talk about design, but of course love and forgiveness and compassion are essential to healthy communities. And the idea was that architects who are developing and designing projects in low income and often disenfranchised communities should really understand that they have an opportunity and in fact a responsibility to bring their skills and presence as a source for healing in these kinds of places that may really need it. So the fellows were very sensitive to their role as interpreters rather than experts. And they shared their experience and their lessons in a book called Made with Love, which is available on our website. And I will share a link to that later in the slides. But I tell this story because the fellows were the pilot group who helped us to define this program as a more open grant opportunity and not limited to architectural designers working in nonprofit community development, but really to a broad range of nonprofit profit organizations interested in doing this kind of collaborative work. So last year we gave 15 collaborative action grants and this year we'll give 20. We've already selected the first 10 and this round, we, we now got this round open for the, for the next 10. So here's a quick snapshot of one of those first collaborative actions. This one is Emily's in Greenwood, Mississippi, and she hosted a community day called Good At Day, which celebrated the unique things that people in the community were good at, and even led to a few spin-offs like these Good At gift certificates, um, which really seeded some small business development, which was much appreciated by some of the local community members. So that first, first group of grantees really described their approach um, in a few different ways, but uh, one of the things they said was really important to do in a collaborative action is to ask the community to help to generate the ideas. Or if you're coming in at a stage where there's already a ton of community awareness and consensus around what's important, listen and bring those ideas from the community to life and be part of the catalyst of taking ideas to action. And similarly, I think this was true um, for several of the projects that we've seen over the years that it's important to build the history and community identity into the future of a project and using an opportunity like this small grant can really connect and bridge some of those concepts of pulling some of that um, local history and voice into the future of a development project that may be moving at full speed and not necessarily have time to pause and integrate some of that local specificity. So I'm going to take a moment now to just share some of the details of the grant program. We're going to do, as I mentioned, 20 grants this year. This is the second round, and um, we'll be giving 5,000 per grantee to 10 more grantees in this round. We ask that you complete the activities within six months of the grant notification. Um, the idea is that this is, the, this is a quick uh, and small um, implementation fund, so um, you should be ready to go when you apply and um, expect to see you getting things done in that shorter period of time and then reporting within the month after you're done. Um, the eligible applications, if you're familiar with Enterprise Community Partners and many of our other grant programs, this program is a little bit different. Um, it's privately funded and we're not as limited to the types of organizations that can apply. So we're generally open to nonprofit 501c3s. Of course, we really love to see housing organizations come in for this grant, especially those for whom it's maybe been um, difficult to get creative placemaking activities going, but now this is an opportunity to spread your wings a little bit in that direction. We love to see that. Um, we have some focus market areas at Enterprise, and of course that's a core priority for us to invest in, but anywhere in the United States is eligible to apply for this grant, and we will certainly choose grantees that are not in our target geographies. In terms of the selection criteria, uh, there are a couple of online application questions that you have to answer. 
basically describing the project and who will be involved and what your plan is for outreach um, and what your concept for how it will impact the broader community or the organization is. And we're really thinking about when we're evaluating these proposals, we have a, a big team of internal enterprise reviewers as well as past grantees that review the uh, collaborative action applications and are thinking about both that context of impact, uh, creativity and in the approaches that you're proposing, engagement of local voices, and then also just real feasibility question. Is this budget and timeline appropriate that we believe you really can get the project done in the six months that you're proposing? So I think um, you can see all of this on the, on the website, uh, and I think many of you know, I've said a couple times, round one is completed, but now this one's open and deadline is June 9th. So check out our website to learn a little bit more and feel free to reach out to us if you have questions that don't get answered during this conversation. So I just want to take a moment um, to highlight a couple of tools and resources that you may find helpful as you develop your proposals. So if, um, there are a few links in the sidebar of the RFP, which is posted on our website, and that may give you some good inspiration and examples. And we also have this wonderful book that I mentioned called Made with Love. This shares eight case studies of the initial collaborative actions that took place in 2013 and 2014. So this book has not only great examples, but it also includes some good advice based on a few of the difficult lessons learned. It's also a, a good model for how how these kinds of projects can have an impact, both at a small and large scale. There's a little impact description for each project featured. It's also available online, so you can read it in a PDF or you can order a printed copy if you follow the link. Um, we also have our community how-to how guides, which are a cool online um, DIY resource, and we have on our online resource center at Enterprise, um, we have a participatory design toolkit by a Rose Fellow and a number of other really cool tools and resources um, for both this kinds of project and others. So I encourage you to explore it. And if you have any trouble finding those, you can always reach out to us and we can help you. I'll also just mention that we're going to be featuring some of last year's collaborative action grantees in a series of upcoming blog posts, so you can stay tuned for those as well. And the conversation we're about to have with three grantees from last year is um, sort of similar but not the same to what we had about a month ago uh, for the first round of the collaborative action grants. So four different panelists joined for that one. So if you're interested in um, listening to what they had to say about their projects, you can skip the first 10 minutes of the same intro I've given now um, and just dig into that conversation if you want to hear a little bit more. It's, uh, it's a good one. So uh, I've blasted through the quick uh, high-level details and overview, and now I want to introduce Emily and um, spend a good solid amount of time having some conversation with our three panelists. So Emily is a social impact architect. She is a co-founder of Delta Design Build Workshop, which is a mission-driven design build firm that focuses on architecture, design, construction, as well as skill development in the partner communities where they work. Emily is a licensed architect who has worked in Tanzania and in the U.S. From 2013 to 2015, she was an Enterprise Rose Architectural Fellow in Mississippi. She was hosted by the Greenwood Economic Development Corporation and the Carl Small Town Center at Mississippi State University. As I mentioned, Emily was part of the group of eight collaborative action projects that piloted this grant program, and hers was Good At Day in Greenwood. So welcome, Emily, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Nella. It's uh, fun to be here, and I really enjoy working on this project. Uh, I read about these these collaborative actions, but then getting to talk with the people who implemented them is a treat, and I hope all the listeners feel the same. So uh, we have three 
past grantees from 2016 with us today. And I just want you to first introduce yourself and your organization, your name and your organization. Let's start with Panat. Uh, we're having some trouble getting the audio for Panat. Uh, perhaps we could circle back. <laughs> All right, let's start with Andrea. Hi, this is Andrea Atkinson. Um, my organization is One Square World. Thank you, and Matthew? Hi, everybody, this is Matthew Slats um, from Charlottesville. I'm with Pause Lab. Great, and uh, we also have Panat Sanaman with us from Envision to Barry in New Iberia, Louisiana. So just to help us get to know your projects and help everyone on the line who's thinking about developing a grant application right now, focusing on community, which is, of course, the, the core of this grant, I want to begin by just giving a little more context about your projects. So beginning with Andrea, can you give us just a little more information? Who is the community you worked with? What defined them? And what was your relationship before beginning this collaborative action? Um, my, I'm, I'm in Boston, um, and the community um, communities that I'm working in um, are based in Eggleston Square, um, it, which is in the city. It's at kind of the corner of Roxbury and Jamaica Plain, which are two. What, Roxbury is a, pre, a predominantly historically black neighborhood, and Jamaica Plain is primarily hispa um, Hispanic. Um, we're confronting a lot of gentrification um, right now, um, so the that, that population is changing, so we're trying to address some of the issues around around that um, while centering around the, the black and Hispanic communities of, of the area. So those are the, the populations, um, and my relationship with them is that I am uh, part of the community in terms of living in the, in the community, um, and I also, um, yeah, I have relationships with a lot of the organizations and people here. Great, thank you. Matthew, could you tell us the same things about your work? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say a lot of similar themes. Um, so we were working in this neighborhood on the south side of downtown Charlottesville, um, which has kind of been an, an, an underused, uh, used to be an industrial area, um, with some housing in it, um, but is is now the the you know the big new uh, future of of the city, and so there's a lot of dynamics that are changing in the neighborhood. And so we've been working for a few years, um, me and a host of others, to kind of engage the community, um, get them to be a part of the of helping to decide the future vision of this neighborhood, and, and not trying to impose an envision on onto them. Um, so our, our project is really about trying to create opportunities for the community to, to collaborate together um, and to share their vision uh, of what they want and what the future of their neighborhood is going to look like. Um, it's about uh, 3,000 people, about 1,500 houses, um, all from all different backgrounds. Um, there's a, a major chunk of affordable housing and public housing in the area, so that's a big uh, piece of we were trying to connect with those communities a, a lot, um, um, and so we're we're a small piece of a much bigger conversation that's going on here in Charlottesville about the future of the city. Great, thank you. And we're just going to jump back to Panat whenever he's back. So um, for the moment, though, uh, Matt, you want to come back to you? Um, a lot, as Mel, Mel mentioned, most of the collaborative action. Because these are relatively small, they're quite nimble, they often can be plugged in and bring some magic to a larger project. Mm -hmm. And Matthew, I think specifically of your project, you all were, you already had some funding secured and um, mm -hmm. you sort of were able to just fit this puzzle piece in. Can you talk about how this collaborative action fit and then how it impacted the larger project? Yeah, that's great. Um, so we were working on this larger project, which we're like we're we're in, coming to the end of right now, actually called BCville. Um, and so the collaborative action was a really great opportunity to kind of like spur kind of a big, um, vibrant, you know, engaging people um, in, a, in a, as broad of a way as possible. Um, 
to kind of kickstart the, that, that larger project. So um, it, we really focused on using it as a way to kind of connect and, and build relationships and, and work with a ton of different people. Like, you know, let's, let's collaborate, let's work together on trying to make something happen, um, not as individuals, but as a community um, and try to see where that can take us. Um, and that just like created a ton of energy for what's been continuing to go on um, since, since the project happened last September. Uh, and so, um, it, it really kind of energized and we tied it into a ton of different other projects that were going on. It wasn't just us, which I think is a really important piece. You're, you're not alone um, in your projects and the more you can collaborate with others, the better. Um, so it, it really brought that energy and it brought that kind of, that, that kind of spurred the, uh, spurred the imagination of the, of the neighborhood in a way that we hoped it would help build energy along for longer term. So um, we're really excited about, about the opportunity. Great. Yeah, I love to, I hope that's not oversimplifying it to say that some yeah. some really good things would have happened. Obviously, there's a lot of happening, public art, but without this funding, the engagement would have been completely different, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think while Matthew's project really plugged into um, a larger project, I think Panat, the work that you all did um, in New Iberia with Envision to Vary, it was really looking at some very broad social and sort of community context issues. Can you talk about how um, Envision to Vary, you know, the methods that you all used to draw out the information in those community-wide issues, and how did you narrow in on the actual action you chose? Sure. Um, we actually, that has a lot to do with the context of the, of the work of Envision the Berry. We've been working within North Berea for the past six or seven years and um, have had an um, ongoing conversation about these large issues. And we're in a small rural southern town in the deep south Louisiana, and um, there's a lot of uh, racial and socioeconomic division within this city. And um, those cities, those um, issues are very uh, um, apparent and known, but a lot of people don't talk about them and didn't know ways to begin addressing them. But through our work, we've been um, sort of um, having a consistent dialogue with the with the community. And the way that we decided to um, sort of bring it down was to choose four specific sites across the city. That's and these sites were. Um, Sites that we had been working and developing in in sort of collaboration with the with the community for the past couple of years, um, sort of envisioning what the community wanted to see and what are what are some of the um, the visions that they that we were gathering from the some of the feedbacks from the past, and um, take and those wound up being places like um, a community garden, a, a market space, an art gallery and um, a, a sort of um, a, a new wing to a, a local museum. And so we decided to use those spaces as a, as a venue to begin sort of um, taking the next, next step in the conversation. Great. I love the picture that I think is on everyone's screen right now where you had projected an image onto a wall and, and people just drew and wrote directly on it. I like that. That's such a good example of sort of directly jumping from from concepts into some reality. And um, and it's a great example of community engagement, which as we said is obviously at the core of collaborative action grants. In One Square World's report, Andrea, you said if it's too facilitated, it doesn't work. It needs to be organic for people to trust it. Can you share with us how you brought flexibility to your engagement process? Sure. Um, well, I think the what ended up happening we had we had um, scheduled five different um, sessions where we would talk about what the community needed and then move towards understanding um, you know how we were going to allocate this kind of micro grant that came from the grant. Um, and what ended up happening is that. Um, as we partnered with different organizations that were working in um, Eccleston Square, it was apparent that needs were different, the, that, the, that we needed to have a lot more conversation about where we were 
um, before getting to where we should invest. Um, so that really gave us the kind of having that flexibility of like shifting things around gave us the opportunity to um, really reflect and take the time to look at all the work that had really already been done in the neighborhood and why looking at look at why um, why we are still the, the where we are um, in the neighborhood in terms of not having enough economic um, development and um, services for people in the community. Um, so it kind of we were able to take a take a bigger view of it because we were flexible. Um, also, we we were able to shift um, uh, with kind of the the changing of the kind of energy of things at the at the country level um, because that definitely had an impact on how priorities shifted on the ground as well. Um, so, so that was really important for us. Nice. Yeah, I think um, when you and I talked one other time, you also said that you didn't even prescribe the meeting types necessarily or exactly what the impact was. And obviously you have to write enough in your grant application that mm -hmm. enterprise and the reviewers know you know what your goals are and what you're planning on doing but then there's also this really wonderful and unique freedom in this grant application to be able to say we're going to have some community events but we don't always know what they look like yet you know we might be able to make up what those community events are based on some community collaboration and interaction it sounds like you all did that wonderfully one of the things i find also really compelling about collaborative actions is that it the, the success or shortfalls don't have any connection to whether something physical is an outcome or not. If it's if there's something constructed and if it's permanent or temporary, those things aren't evidence of success of a project. Uh, in this round from last year, we saw projects in the the San Francisco Bay Area. Bay Area. We saw projects in um, Denver, in Thunder Valley, in South Dakota, all of which were very very tangible. Um, they were constructed works. And we talked about those more on the other call that Nella mentioned earlier. Um, in those types of works, we don't have anyone from those specific examples on the call today, but one thing that we like to remind people is that if you are doing something like that, you're adding sort of an art piece or a community piece or a collaborative, maybe all three pieces to a built project, we want to make sure that it's not tacked on the surface, but it does have some meaning. And so Kaziah Havalon uh, described that really well on the last call. But on the call today, we have Matthew who did build something. Um, it was temporary and uh, it was certainly impactful. Matthew, how did you all come up with the idea of a giant rocket? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we built a 30 foot tall by, well, 10 foot wide, but then there's more at the bottom by 30, kind of a huge space we took over, uh, cardboard rocket. So. We knew we were going into this project in the fall, and again, like I mentioned before, we we're like, okay, how do we get people interested? And with a real strong belief that youth are really important to be uh, involved in this, we turned it over to two uh, teenage interns to kind of guide the process, to be honest. Um, so we, through the city of Charlottesville, um, we uh, have this, these two interns, uh, uh, Maya and Devaney, who worked with us all over the summer before we did the project. And we kind of sat down with them, and we had, we had a sense of what we wanted to accomplish, but we didn't really know what the form of it would be. And so we just turned it over to them. We said, well, we're, here's what we're doing. You know, we're, we're going to be doing this year-long engagement process. Um, it's going to result in this. Like, how can we get the 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 community participating? And um, they came up with the idea. Uh, we said one of the things we said is like we want to do something that's going to really inspire people. So, um, Civil Galaxy, we we attempted to break a Guinness Book of World Records um, uh, for the largest cardboard sculpture. We're still waiting to hear back on that. Um, but once we kind of came up with the idea, we set them to task. They they went out and like. They went out and did all this research about how to build stuff with cardboard. We did a bunch of sessions on like actually building cardboard. We worked with a bunch of neighborhood kids to like build like spacesuits and whatnot, um, just to sort out like how do we actually make this all happen. Um, and they helped guide that process, um, and, and we worked on it together. So 
uh, it was an amazing opportunity to kind of see them like, use their imagination and creativity to help kind of be a part of the neighborhood and get to know the neighborhood and I think in a way that they never had before. That's great. So I, th I think that's a great example of, of how a physical object is so much more than the object. It was this whole process yeah. and experience and, and change in the way people interacted with each other. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Bronzeville Soup, which was also one of our speakers on our last call, and a community of friends had events. Um, Envision to Berry had some potlucks. And um, thinking about those specific events, those gathering moments, Panat, could you talk to us about how that your collaborative action catalyzed some other actions and also maybe how it influenced your organization? Yes, um, the series of four potlucks was a time to really gather information from these different cross-sector groups in across our city. And um, we gathered um, feedback on how the community would like to see their, their, uh, their communities, their neighborhoods evolve. And um, we worked with an artist to take that feedback to convert those into renderings of the neighborhood that that showed the vi the vision that the community offered and suggested um, completely realized, and we used um, that vision and a lot of that feedback that we got during those potluck dinners to um, create a community billboard. And um, so, what that basically was is a, a a projector that we project on different surfaces across the city in the evening time. But we also used the projector as a way to um, um, sort of open it up, sort of an open source community um, information board so people would send in what, what was happening with their own organizations or church groups or school clubs and we would be able to display that. So it's an ongoing um, sort of series of actions that involve um, receiving information from the community and then processing that and putting that up into the community billboard. Great, and who can use that billboard? Anyone within the uh, the community that uh, is doing something that's um, publicly oriented, and so we have everybody from like um, people that do church groups that do um, family fun days, or P or nonprofit groups that are, are announcing um, festival festivals or volunteer days, things like that. Great. That's something else we see a lot is. I know that those people weren't necessarily sort of your focused community, those those partners, but I think that's part of the collaboration is that we often set out and do our the bulk of our collaboration with a certain segment of the population, but then we also often end up with these other communities, and it might be communities of partner nonprofits that we're also collaborating with. Yeah, we find um, that there. Great. A lot of overlap in the constituents. I bet. Nice. Nella says, I have a quote, $5,000 is enough to do something, but not enough to overthink, and leave space to learn and adjust. Andrea, I wondered if you would tell us, we want to hear about both the successes and the challenges, but really I would like to hear about the challenges <laughs> with uh, engaging people that One Square World experienced at Eggleston Square. Well, I would definitely say that I would. I you can still overthink things with five thousand dollars. In terms of the challenges, I would just say, you know, um, I would say, let's see. Um, I would focus on just the fact that uh, I guess one one of the things, a couple of the things that we've learned are that um, just because you build it they won't, it's not necessarily like they will come. Um, and it's really, really important to co-create processes um, with people that you're engaging. Um, so, you know, that was part of what we, what we tried to design into the, um, you know, the, the whole strategy, but it also, you know, it, it proved to be true. So we really did learn, um, learn that that is true. You know, you can't just build it and think that people are going to come, even if things are fun. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that is the, the, 
the big lesson learned. Um, and also that people are really busy, you know, there's a lot going on um, and poverty, you know, is, is expensive and, um, and also time consuming. So um, figuring out how to make sure that the work is not adding on to kind of the burdens of, of, of that people have going on in their lives, um, but are supporting um, and adding value to to the the day to the day to day, I think um, are are a couple of the things that we learned. I agree with that very much. I think that community engagement is certainly something that's not easy, and if we pretend it is, we're probably not doing it very well. I think uh, Panat, uh, how did you address the question of capacity building through the collaborative action? And I think you sort of touched on this already with your billboard, but um, if you have anything especially to add about the, the capacity and the technical sort of capacity. Right. Um, so with our organization being um, sort of working in the spirit to sort of gather um, a holistic community vision of how New Iberia will progress, we've, we um, always try to find ways to um, add on Add um, add to that vision or shape reshape it um, to to form more to make it to make it more precise, if you will, and um, and definitely the the projector and the community billboard allows us gives us a tool a, a device that will that serves as a platform and, and a conduit to um, take information from the community and be able to project and display that. To a large, to a larger audience that may not have access to um, or travel to certain parts of the community or don't, doesn't always read the paper. So, um, so you know, when we initially started to think about this grant, we were thinking about doing just a series of YouTube videos and pu putting those on social media. But we really wanted to, you know, we had to adapt that and think of a way for how the community and the organization could continually um, benefit and have a greater amount of capacity to do what it needs to do and get information out. And so, um, you know, we were, we, we sort of thought about how we can create a video or digital, um, digital media that would be sort of an open source uh, device that can sort of bring in information from all around the community and then be able to sort of enhance and sort of uh, Bring bring attention to to different efforts that are going out there around the around the city. Great, and so it sounds like you even learned something through the application process itself. Oh yeah, certainly. Um, you know, just um, we had to really challenge ourselves to sort of um, take the five thousand dollars and what would come out of this and what we were getting out of it to you know, make as much impact as possible. And so, you know, having this uh, projector and this digital billboard was, you know, a way that we could constantly get um, content and be able to update content from the community and um, be able to inform our work as well within the community. Awesome. So this is, I have one last question. I mean, I, Pitch it to, Matt, to Matthew, and then if either of the other of you want to jump in on it, wonderful. And if not, we can go straight to questions. Uh, by definition, collaborative actions are localized responses to the context of a place. How was your project uniquely suited to the place in which it took place? And maybe how could it have been more specifically tailored if you had it to do again? Yeah. Um, so. Like I mentioned earlier, the place that I'm working on or the neighborhood that I'm working in is undergoing massive amounts of change and, and we'll be doing that for a long time. So the question, uh, and I should say that was a part of a much larger initiative that the city was pushing forward to kind of envision what the future of this is. Um, and I think there's a lot of kind of uh, tension in that, right? Like who's making this decision? Um, and so one of the things we wanted to model was a different way of thinking about like how do you engage the community and doing it creatively and really like the belief that like engagement isn't a one-time thing. Um, I mean, I'm, I've been like listening to the other panelists today. I've really been inspired by the way that they, they're thinking not just in the one-time action, but it's a, 
it's an ongoing conversation that should really never end in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, we wanted to use Seville Galaxy in building this, you know, building this 30-foot tall cardboard rocket as a way to, to, to kind of start that conversation, continue it going, um, and seeing it build over time um, so that we could really understand what residents needed and wanted and how we could advocate for investments to be made in the neighborhood that were, that were coming from them. Um, and really believing that that the experts, when you're thinking about neighborhood to redevelopment or development in general investment, is like residents are the experts. They they're the ones that know what needs to happen on their streets. And so, how can we advocate for them to be to play a much larger role in this? Um, and and I think that you know, with this small project, we kind of model the opportunity to do that and build on something that has been really wonderful. I love it. Panat or Andrea, do you want to jump in on that question? No, I think uh, I think that was great. I agree. I think great. I think that's a wonderful place to to end is by saying that this doesn't end. This type of work <laughs> is always ongoing. The best engagement is not at all about showing up and then leaving, but it's about being committed to a place. Donna, do you have some question and answers for us to go to? We do. We have some in the Q&A box. And again, I would encourage anyone with questions to go ahead and type them in now into the Q&A box. It's on the lower right-hand side of your screen. And we've got some more coming in, which is great. Our first question is, can an organization that is not a 501c3 apply if we have a fiscal partner or receiver that is a 501c3? Yes, um, I'll take that one. A fiscal sponsorship is totally fine. Um, we've had a few small community groups that don't have 501c3 status, but they have a large organization that's willing to provide it or something like Fractured Atlas. So that totally works. Okay. Our next question is, when did grant applicants begin the process of deciding what to do? during the grant open window, or were they working on their idea well before they wrote for the grant? Um, can we hear from each of you on that? Maybe we'll start with Andrea. What was sure. your um, process? This was, uh, I guess, this is part of a bigger initiative. So this is part of our program, programmatic uh, offerings as an organization. Um, so we were already looking to do work in Eggleston Square. Um, so this was this kind of kicked us off, but we already had kind of a thought of how it would work. Um, so it helped us to think it through, um, but kind of the, the the idea behind the bigger uh, the bigger entity, the bigger program, was already thought through beforehand. And Panat, how about you? I think um, our, our organization um, is sort of built into our mission. We've always been oriented towards projects that help build, um, that, that serve as forums for public discourse, especially through um, sort of creative means. And so uh, it was sort of a natural fit when we came across the project, the actual thinking about uh, a projector and um, doing the potlucks those specific ways didn't get determined until the grant um, application process. Mm -hmm. We've had um, some applicants in the past who really uh, use this as an opportunity to leverage other funds as well um, or have supplemented and filled a gap in a larger project. Maybe they had a $20,000 budget and they were able to make it whole with this. Um, and then some that really just come in and build the build the project kind of based on this opportunity. Um, Matthew, what was the situation for you guys? Yeah, so um, this was a part of a second year of a grant that we got from the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, we got had gotten an Our Town grant with the city like a year and a half before this. Um, and so we got through that first year, and then we were kind of rethinking what we had kind of originally proposed based on the feedback we got from the community. 
Um, and so um, if, if we hadn't gotten this grant, I, I think we would, we would still have been doing a lot of work in the neighborhood, but we wouldn't have been able to kind of achieve a way of inspiring the neighborhood in the way that we, we'd hope to. Um, so, so when, 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 like when I, when this popped up, actually it popped up in an, an email um, from the NEA, uh, the grant opportunity uh, that we, we were in a newsletter and I was like, oh my God, this is like exactly what we were hoping to accomplish. Um, and there's a great opportunity to pursue something. So it fit in to what we were hoping to make happen, but uh, at the time didn't have the, 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 the actual funding to do. So, um, um, and then the, the, the idea kind of rolled from there really quickly. Um, so it, it created that, created that opportunity. That's very that helpful. Is, yeah. I would just like to add that I think, this is Emily, that I think the ideas can evolve very quickly, as Matthew just said, for how to respond. The thing that takes time is to understand the place and the issue that needs to be responded to. And that probably isn't going to happen between today and June 9th if you already don't have that understanding. So I think it's about that, the context and making sure that you're responding to a context. But then running with an idea, that can happen sort of in the amount of time you can invest in it. Yeah, so I see a couple other questions and I'm going to just jump into them um, because I think they build on this conversation we're having. One of them is just can the project already be ongoing? And so I would just say that, um, of course, yes, it, and as we've just described, it often is in some form or other um, already initiated or a concept. Um, but, but it is nice for us to understand how this small grant um, makes a difference in it, so makes maybe a little something extra possible that wasn't otherwise. So, um, you know, a large project with a, with a lot of moving parts that are already going to be in play, and this is just kind of plugging into that, um, sometimes doesn't rise to the top of the applications as the ones that really feel like, wow, this little piece of funding makes a difference in their ability to uh, create change or um, engage in a special way that they weren't otherwise able to. So it's not that we wouldn't fund that, but often reviewers can tell, you know, if this is just another piece of of money in that funding puzzle versus a little extra something special. So um, ten, the, our review panel tends to like to do that extra something special. Um, and then also I, I saw a question about, um, where did it go? Oh, how do you reflect this um, flexibility to listen to the community and the need for some unknowns in a compelling application. And maybe, um, Emily, since you've just recently been reading and thinking about what you've seen across a lot of applications, you could share some sense of that. And then if we feel like there's a couple of these um, panelists who might add something, we could go to them too. Yeah, um, I think that, I guess my answer is a little bit more of a what not to do than a what to do because it is hard to prescribe how to um, reflect flexibility. I think the what not to do is not to say this, this is our organization's mission and it's what we have decided needs to be done in this place. It's because it needs to be what the community is working on. You know, maybe we see a lot of good applications where there had, has already been some sort of planning process or some level of engagement that brought to light a topic, whether it's um, an asset or a liability in a community that the, that an organization can respond to. Or well, alternatively, if a group says, you know, our our mission is about green building and our application is all about educating people on the importance of green building. Everybody loves energy efficiency and saving resources, but that feels a little bit like it's being put upon the community. So I think. The idea of being able to say we're being, we're being responsive is sort of first in there for me. But then also being able to say we're going to have, I think very specifically, if you said we're going to have some community events, um, maybe each one builds upon the next one. That could be a great example of flexibility. So we know exactly what we're going to do for the first one, and then the second and third one will be built out of that. Um, or even just to say that we're going to have a gathering here or a gathering there 
but we're still determining exactly, you know, if there will be, um, if it will be potluck style or if it will be a dance or it could be any number of things, but we're still trying to figure that out. I think that's also an example of flexibility in a planned process. Andrea, do you want to um, add any thoughts to that? I feel like you talked a little bit about it yeah. earlier, but. Sure. I think um, the way that I managed with this was that I already, I, you know, I had a, uh, I had a basic question that I was asking, which was, um, what are the assets and needs of this community? Um, so we we kind of left it open in that in that way, um, and that set us up to say, look, this is about listening. This isn't about you know creating something, and then something will will happen out of that listening. Um, and in addition, um, I communicated I communicated a lot with you guys about um, about how things were shifting. Um, and you mm -hmm. were very responsive to that. So I don't think that's the case with every funder, um, but I do think it is the case with you guys. Um, and I think it's also good for us as applicants to always be pushing um, funders into the better decision <laughs> of like being more flexible about, you know, how funds are responsive to community needs rather than imposing a, a specific plan. Um, so, well, one of the things that's really nice about this, um, this, grant program and with our at about our engagement with you and even our conversation specifically that you and I had Andrea is that you know part of what we like to learn through this grant because it is also a like slightly less risky investment for us is where are the pitfalls or what mm -hmm. are the challenges so that we can either design the program better to accommodate those but also so that we're just learning about the realities of how this kind of work happens on the ground um, and that's really educational and important to us and um, mm -hmm. we we so we like that back that back and forth mm -hmm. yeah it's so all about another relationship question. with the funder too. yeah 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 um, uh, another question is does there have to be a physical product at the end or a temporary enhancement to a physical space um, you know, creative placemaking, quote unquote, the term creative placemaking, which this this project, these projects certainly are an example of, um, can can take a lot of forms. And I would say what what we really saw, and maybe Emily, you can echo this, is that you know across the board. And I, I'll answer another question as I answer this one. Um, last year we got 117 applications for the 15 that we selected. This year we had 55 in the first round, and um, I expect we'll get as many or more in the second round. So for the for the 10 we're choosing for each round, um, we see a lot, of course, uh, that are realizing something whether temporary or permanent that's physical in the built environment, um, but we see plenty that are an event um, and also in the Made with Love book you'll see some descriptions of how do you capture both, how do you document an event as well as capture the impact of an event. And um, so we are open to either, there's no requirement that it be something um, that's like built in the physical environment, but we'll, we will have some of those as well, and, and we like to see the range, um, and we like to see stuff that's maybe a little out of the ordinary when it is an event. So Emily, I don't know if you want to add anything, maybe some examples that pop to mind. Yeah, um, I think I agree with Nella. I think it absolutely does not have to be a physical product. Um, Often the ones that aren't at all physical in some way end up leading into something, I think, of good at day. But I had such a wonderful time planning in 2013. It was an event and that was all. Um, that $5,000 supported an event. But the partner on that event was an organization that really was trying to start a local neighborhood-based community center. And it was about two years later, but a lot of relationships and conversations and thinking about space that was catalyzed through Good At Day resulted in us opening a community center. So um, even though the $5,000 absolutely had nothing to do with, um, you know, buying a piece of lumber, it had everything to do with that space eventually existing. Um, looking at the, the first 10 that we just awarded, we have a real mix of, of things that will result in physical and tangible and things that will be documented, shared experiences of communities that that will have all kinds of 
outcomes and impact. I think that, um, you know, as Nella said, the more creative, the better often. We had, um, we had a couple of applications that were fully sound-based in the last round. Those were some of the really interesting ones to me. People are documenting or um, projecting sound in different ways. I think we have a question today about um, an organization that's about dance, that's a dance company, and they're asking if we have to partner with another visual arts organization. You certainly can partner with a visual arts organization if that's uh, the path you want to go down, but you're not required to. Dance in itself could be a collaborative action, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a couple questions about partnership and um, applying as a, a lead applicant. Um, someone has to be the main point of contact filling out the application, but we absolutely welcome partnerships. And um, you can just describe it in your narrative, or you can, if you have enough uh, characters in the in the organization description, you can put the two names together. Um, but you can always ask those detailed questions to the design at enterprisecommunity.org email. I want to close with one last question, um, and would love to just hear a, a word or a couple words from each of the panelists on this. Uh, do you have any advice about how to invite community members in and engage them as partners and decision makers? So let's go to um, Matthew first. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think it gets about building relationships, and you have to. And the, the best way to build those relationships is by being together. Um, the more you can kind of recognize one another and get to know one another, I think the, the stronger and the more, the bigger impact um, projects like these can happen. So, so I, I really, one thing I, we really pride ourselves in trying to do is like, you know, going door to door, being on the streets, engaging people where, where they are and trying to work from there. Great, Andrea? Um, I would say take a racial equity training, <laughs> uh, and um, I would say um, you know get be humble and get involved in what's already going on in the community. Um, so and, and learn from what's already going on. Thanks, and Pana. Not, are you on mute? <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm on mute. Sorry. <laughs> I, was, I said uh, offer free food. Uh, <laughs> we're really successful in bringing in people that I had never seen at any of these kinds of events. You know, we um, we've had several events like this before in the past, and um, it's usually like the same sort of community leaders and group of people that show up. But um, when when we put out the word that it's going to be a potluck and that um, we also provided some of the food, some of the food would be free. We had people show up that we had never seen before and they, had, they brought really great ideas and, and we, we just loved, we really loved that, you know, so free food. Always a good trick. So we're right at three o'clock Eastern. Um, Donna, do you want to give your, your final closing spiel? <laughs> Happy to do so. Just a reminder that if you did happen to miss any portion of this webinar or you simply want to revisit, it has been recorded. We'll be sending a link to the archive with, with a copy of the slides and the recording to all attendees. Uh, generally within 48 hours since today's Friday, we'll call it late afternoon, Monday, early morning, Tuesday at the worst. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists today and also thank you, our attendees, for joining us. We really appreciate you having, having you here. And with that, this closes out today's webinar. Again, thanks for joining us. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.